Jonas Betkinson's sharply evocative images explore themes of community, faith, and identity with inspiring honesty. He has made major bodies of works all over the world. At the same time, as he always also photographs the daily rhythms of life at home. As well as many critically acclaimed long form projects, he has also produced significant work for many commercials and editorial clients. Betkinson was born in Norway and he began his career at the age of 19 years old as an entrance at Magnum's London's office before leaving for Russia to pursue his work as a photojournalist. Throughout several years he spent there, Betkinson's photographed stories from the fringes of the former Soviet Union, a project that has been published in the book Satellite in 2006. His most recent book, The Last Testaments from 2017, told the story of seven men who had claimed to be the biblical Messiah's return to earth. His editorial clients include magazines such as National Geographic, Stearns, Time, Newsweek, The Sunday Times Magazine, The Guardian's Weekends, and the commercial site he has done projects for HSBC, Canon, Fuji, BCG, Red Bull, and Land Rover. Betkinson's became a nominee of Magnum Photo in 2004 and a member in 2008. He lives with his wife and three children outside of Oslo in Norway. Jonas, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will, I will let you share yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's see. Let me just uh, get into my screen. I hope you can see it now. Uh, so um, there was, um, you know, clearly some uh, false information here. Um, I need to update my bio somewhere um, because um, I'm going to talk about my actual latest book, which is called The Book of Veles, which is this one, which is uh, not the one which was just mentioned. Uh, <laughs> so um, I will uh, talk a little bit about this book and, and some of the experiences around it, which are relevant to sort of the, the, um, the world we live in today. So uh, this book is about the town of Veles in uh, uh, North Macedonia. Um, I first got interested in Veles um, in uh, 2016 or 17, just after Trump was elected, because Veles placed itself on the world map in 2016 as a global hub of fake news, of misinformation. Um, and the way this happened is that, you know, this is a town uh, of about 50,000 people where there's a lot of youth unemployment, all the old factories that were active in previous decades have shut down, big steel smelter and porcelain factory, all have been standing still for over a decade. So young people there don't have much to do. But some um, young people here figured out a way back in 2016 to earn quick money. And it was, it was by creating um, websites that uh, uh, pretended to be American news portals. So it started small. It started with just a few people who decided to try, hey, let's make a website. Uh, we populate it with, uh, you know, classic uh, fake news, um, um, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, sensationalist clickbait. And we send it into the algorithms of Facebook and Twitter and see if anyone bites. And they had uh, all kinds of banner advertisements on it so that whoever clicked on this news portal, this fake news portal, uh, would send basically income back to the people who made the site in Veles, Macedonia. Um, so some people tried it. And this was just in the, the run up to the 2016 election in America. And um, and it caught fire and, and, you know, it became hugely popular. Um, and then, you know, lots of other people in Veles realized, oh, there's money to be made. So they ended up, lots of people there created together hundreds of, of these fake news, clickbait news sites that, although based in Veles, pretended to be American sites. So they had names like New York Times Politics Today, uh, dot com. 
uh, trumpnews365.com, usdailynews.com, this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, so they became a sort of um, uh, epicenter, you could say, for, for, for the distribution and production of fake news, this small time in North Macedonia. I found this very fascinating. I found fascinating the idea of sort of uh, young people in, in, in one part of the world could you sort of not with, without even uh, intending to have an influence on, on politics, even in Washington. I mean, these guys were totally apolitical. So they had no political agenda. They just needed to earn some hard cash quickly, uh, which they did. Uh, so it had a sort of um, self-enforcing uh, effect. The more successful the conspiracy theories and fake news they sent out was, the more money they earned and, and the more they continued doing this. Uh, as I was researching um, Veles, you know, I mean, this started really, you know, when I was sitting after Trump was elected and I was wondering what just happened, you know, what happened to information? What happened to journalism? You know, we were suddenly in this um, arena where, you know, uh, we were talking about alternative facts instead of facts. We were talking about, you know, anything that you didn't agree, didn't agree with was suddenly called fake news, fake information. And this was sort of a new information landscape. And I was wondering where this was headed. I, you know, this was also the time we were seeing the first sort of prototypes of synthetic imagery, um, you know, images not produced by cameras. For example, we saw these deep fake videos where you can change the face of someone talking, you know, or, you know, we started seeing artificial intelligence generated uh, portraits. Um, this all was happening around the same time. And, 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 you know, it made me question how we both produce and consume information. Um, so I thought that the story of what happened in Veles was very relevant in, in this regards. Um, you know, these guys in, in Veles were basically, you know, information hackers. They, they hacked into our information flow and, and sort of subverted it somehow. Uh, as I was reading about Veles, um, uh, you know, um, I started coming across other strange parallel stories. I was reading about the town of Veles, but then I discovered the story of Veles the God. Uh, Veles was one of the pre-Christian pagan Slavic gods, one of the most important ones. And he um, was, you know, he was the god of, of, of chaos and mischief and magic. You know, he was a shapeshifter. He would, you know, walk around and um, appear as a bear in front of people and try to sort of create um, uh, chaos. Uh, if you know Norse mythology, I'm from Norway, um, you know, we have a, a character called Luke, this god called Luke, and, and, and Veles was very much a Luke kind of guy. So I was reading about the god Veles, and then I came across the story of the book of Veles. The book of Veles was basically, um, Something that was found by this man, uh, Fyodor Isenbeck. He was uh, an officer in the White Russian Army that was fighting the Bolsheviks after the Russian Revolution. So on the campaign trail in Siberia, uh, he found in a burned out building some 40 uh, wooden boards with ancient inscriptions on them. Some sort of ancient manuscript in a language nobody could read. Um, he collected these planks uh, and gave them to another Russian scientist, this guy called Yuri Mirulubov, who after some years managed to crack the linguistic code and uh, discovered that this was an ancient manuscript that was also called the Book of Veles, the same uh, that title as my own book. Um, and, um, you know, if you go into a, a bookshop in Moscow today, you can find lots of volumes of, of the Book of Veles. Uh, it's quite a popular manuscript. It is about... Um, so the ancient uh, Slavic people's history and this god uh, Veles, etc. Um, and it's pop popular in sort of nationalist and new age kind of circles. Um, it was translated in 1973 into English uh, by a guy at the university in, in the United States. 
The only thing here is that all modern uh, historians and scientists and linguists have concluded that the Book of Ellis itself is a forgery created by these two men for sort of God knows what reasons, but, um, but uh, it's basically uh, an early example of, of, of uh, disinformation that they produced uh, back in the 1920s. Uh, but that has stuck and is with us today and it's actually quite popular today. I thought this was amazing parallels, you know, the story of, of, of the contemporary fake news producers in Veles that I wanted to make a story about uh, in my own photographic way, and this ancient manuscript, which was also a piece of, of fake news, you could say. So in my book, you can see I, I, I mix these stories. You have photographs, you have these facsimiles of the ancient book of Veles uh, as it appeared, and also uh, headlines uh, from the fake news websites that the guys in Veles created. Here you can see a computer programmer comes forward, admits to being paid to rig voting booths. Trump was right. And this is from the website usadailypolitics.com, which is actually a fake news website created in Veles, Macedonia. So that's how you move through my book. Uh, some facsimiles from the ancient text of the Book of Veles and headlines from, from the fake news websites. Here we are from 365usanews.com and then these photographs of, of the environment that these people uh, operated in. And this was work that was created in people's kitchens, in back rooms. I mean, it was a real sort of this fake news production. It was a sort of a, a homemade kind of affair, you know, where they were just experimenting and trying to find new ways to do things. And, and so what was successful, what made people click on these articles and, and you know, whatever, you know, what became popular, you know, they would make more of. So that is how I, I, I started this project. But um, there is more to the story than uh, what I've said so far, because um, like I said, I was interested in this emergence of synthetic imagery. Um, you know, uh, deep fake videos, images uh, created by artificial intelligence, uh, rendered images instead of captured on camera images. And I, I started wondering before I went to Veles, like, where is this technology at today? How hard is it to, to use these technologies to produce images from a computer chip instead of from a camera, as I have always done? Um, I started downloading some of the software that enabled you to do this. Uh, I mean, software used by computer game industry and film industry to create, for example, uh, 3D um, avatars, you know, that can be standing uh, as humans or computer game characters. Uh, how hard is it to use this technology? Uh, and I started playing with it. So, wow, you know, is, is it gotten so easy and the technology is so good that even one averagely nerdy freelance photographer like myself can basically use this technology to create a fake um, a photo reportage. Um, and as I was experimenting with it, I realized, you know, I think the answer to that question is going to be a scary one. So that is what I actually set out trying to do when I went to Veles. So you see here an image of this man and a dog sitting on this car. Well, it wasn't actually like that. You know, it was, the scene was more like this. It was an empty scene and all the people uh, you have seen in the images so far basically don't exist. These are 3D models. Uh, these are computer game characters that I have sort of put into a photojournalistic context. So while we see this scene, you know, it's something that a photojournalist like myself would be very excited to see probably, you know, you have a broken down factory, very symbolic. You have this poor man keeping himself warm by the fire. Maybe he lives inside the bus. You have a car wreck, you have kids running around, a classic sort of world press photo award-winning scene, you know? Well, it's just too good to be true. Uh, so, so this is how I, I went there. You know, we, we know that the guys in Veles got rich from creating fake news, you know, and people bought new cars. Yeah. And yes, I saw people park in strange ways when I was in Veles, but maybe not as strange as this um, and, 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 and so forth. 
um, two people standing by a fast food uh, cafe. Um, just a figment of my imagination. Um, and, and this is basically how I created this whole report. Uh, just in short, how was it done? Um, we see this portrait of this girl. You know, you, you see in the book, she looks like, you know, a portrait of someone who was involved in the fake news. Well, you have to start with, with a, a model. Um, uh, you have to clothe them. You have to, um, you know, shape them. Uh, you can morph them in any way you want, uh, you know, tall, short, big, small, you know, wrinkles, uh, texture of skin, etc. You know, my wife is uh, very uh, frustrated because I have, uh, you know, spent 10 times the amount of uh, money on, on the, the wardrobe of these avatars than I have spent on myself in the last 10 years, probably. Uh, but all this software is basically uh, free to download, then one can start it, and then you know you can maybe have to buy some clothes and some 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 uh, special things. And and like you can see here, you have to you know uh, create expressions, poses. So you can every muscle in the body, every joint, every muscle you can uh, manipulate. You can animate them. You can motion capture them, or you can just use pre canned poses as well. Um, so there are basically infinite amount of possibilities. Uh, when I went around, like I said, I did go to Vélez, I photographed the background scenes uh, and populated them with, with uh, a layer of uh, false information. So basically, the first thing I did after capturing the scene of the stairwell is to convert that um, image into a 3D model. This is also free software, anyone can do it, it's not hard, and then create a space in which to insert these sort of uh, 3D models into. Um, and you can see here, you know, they're wearing these kind of anonymous masks, etc. And that is basically because in the original story of what happened in Veles, you know, when the guys in Veles uh, were discovered to be this amazing hub of false information, all the world's media went to Veles. Uh, sort of in the end of 2016, beginning of 2017. New York Times, BBC, Wired, uh, Guardian, they all went there. And I realized it, it looked like it was hard to get access to these people. You know, they were trying to stay anonymous. Nobody wanted to really be photographed, you know, because of course they were worrying about the reputation, etc. So in my uh, fake imagery of, of, of the fake news producers, I tried to um, to, to, to retain that sort of, of sense of distance to these people. I wanted it to look like, um, you know, I went there and I, I didn't have great access to them. I was struggling to get access to this um, environment like uh, I probably would if I had gone there to do the real story. So, you know, the story of what happened in Veles and the fake news production there is, is very much a real one. Uh, but everything you see is basically fake. So it's a fake uh, photo essay about fake news producers. You know, the thing is, you have no limits to what you can do. So you remember, maybe I told you about the god Veles, you know, the god of mischief and chaos and fakery, um, which has the same name as the town. Well, I told you he was a shapeshifter, right? I mean, like when he went around trying to uh, conduct his evil plans, he would often appear to people as a bear. So I wanted Veles, the god, to appear in my picture. So I started seeing bears all over Veles. Well, I didn't see them, of course. I just bought a 3D model of a bear and put them into my pictures and made the bear walk around. So I could be a sort of National Geographic wildlife photographer without leaving my office. Um, some of the other images, you know, they're kind of too good to be true. And that's how I wanted images to be. You know, I wanted to leave breadcrumbs and hints that, you know, there's something wrong. This is too much. Uh, there's something not to be believed in these pictures. And I wanted the, in, the whole project to be almost like a, a Turing test, you know. Uh, can we tell the difference between something that is a machine or machine made and something that is human or human made. Um, so all of these images, there are, are, are small hints at uh, this not being real. Um, all the people you see, 
animals and objects you know there are there are, there are suspicious things going on in every single image even if it doesn't have people in it i also wanted to play with that sort of classic journalistic cliche we have of this part of the world the sort of eastern europe cliches you know you see this in documentary photography and photojournalism all over the place of how we see uh you know so eastern europe broken down factories soviet era apartment blocks and i wanted to in a way almost create a parody of of this the, the sort of cliches of photojournalism and maybe even a parody of my own work um, um and sort of play into this um you know what would we want this story of fake news producers in Macedonia? What, what, what do we want it to look like? You know, well, it should probably look something like this, you know, shady guys sitting in sort of crummy apartment buildings. Of course, we need some soldiers, some rifles, barbed wire, and, and, and you know, grainy journalistic looking images. Um, you know, so I try to play into these kind of stereotypes. Uh, and, and of course, you know, uh, like I mentioned, uh, this uh, strange bear that's walking around sort of signaling that something's wrong. So in a way, it, this project for me as a photographer was very unique because I was walking around there photographing these empty scenes, trying to imagine what would I myself have wanted to photograph if I was there? You know, which kind of scenes would I want to try to get into? Uh, if I was standing at this street corner, you know, what, what would I be waiting for? What kind of people would I be interested in meeting? Um, so I usually don't actually say exactly what is computer generated and what is reality in these images. That's a part of the sort of treasure hunt one can uh, do with this project uh, later but you know as I was getting to know this technology by the way I have to say you know I have no prior experience of working with these kind of technologies everything I know about how this is done I learned by sitting a few hours on on, on YouTube tutorials you know I have no I'm no training in any of this but the fact is this is actually that simple to do that all you need is is you know some free software to get started some YouTube tutorials and off we go we create even visual fake news uh, as I was getting into this whole production I started you know, discovering other arenas where synthetic information is making great developments. For example, it's not just happening in imagery. Um, the uh, technology of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, text generation is moving very, very quickly. And all the big tech companies are, are sort of vying for supremacy on, on this arena. It's become a prestige competition almost. Um, and I wanted to see, you know, can I make use of any of that? So I found an open source system uh, through something called OpenAI. They have an um, AI text generation system that at that point was called GPT-2, uh, but now it's already way bypassed by GPT-3 and soon GPT-4, a very powerful system. Basically, the way they work is that, you know, you have a, a machine learning system that is trained to... Uh, train itself to write English uh, by just mathematically sampling, let's say, 16 million uh, website texts. Nobody has taught any grammar to these systems, uh, uh, any rules about language. It's basically just mathematical comparisons of, of millions of websites. And you can train them. So if you feed this GPT system with, with the entire works of Shakespeare, in the other end, you will get more Shakespeare verse. If you feed it with a holy Bible, it will start spitting out sort of the inspirational Bible text at the other end. So what I did, because any book like this, any photo book like the Book of Ellis, uh, it needs to have a, 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 an introductory essay, right? That's about um, the, the issue of fake news, about my experiences in Ellis, etc., etc. Uh, so what I did 
was that I took all the English language articles I could find where journalists actually went to Veles to make a report about the fake news production scene there. Uh, I took all those articles and, and put it into one long document and trained the artificial intelligence system on that. And the result is that this 5,000 word essay about my experiences here uh, was written in, in its entirety by artificial intelligence. I didn't write a single word of it. All I did was I, you know, you can generate infinite amounts of uh, such articles because it's just written by a computer. I had it uh, generate a bunch of different versions and I cut and pasted different sections that I liked together. Uh, and I also sort of prodded it into different uh, directions. Like I need some interviews, I need some descriptions of LS, I need some sort of political background, I need something about myself. And, and this is all written by machine. And if you look at it and you don't know much about this story, you would probably buy into it. You know, you can see the headline there. It doesn't look off by any means. The only thing it writes stuff like, how did a town that used to produce clothing in China? Uh, well, they didn't actually produce clothing so much in Belles. They produced steel and stuff like that. But, you know, the computer has no relationship to the fact. It just has sort of picked up that, you know, there was industrial production in Belles. So it, it writes clothing instead of steel or it says now house thousands of fake news websites so it has sort of mathematically computed that in Veles they made you know a great number of websites fake news websites the real number was in the hundreds not in the thousands but when you just read it like that you might not even notice you know and and and, and the text goes on and on and, and you know if you don't know much if you're not prepared to un know that this is uh, fake, you probably just wouldn't pick up on it. This is all written by by machine. And in the book, I also have portraits of these so-called so fake news producers, but as I already told you, these are just uh, computer-generated 3D models, right? But they kind of look real. Uh, on some of them, I have quotes, you know, like you would have in a photo book like this, you know, you, you see this person and you see something this person said, but these quotes are made the exact same way. So I went into all these uh, articles about, about Veles, and I found every place where someone who was involved in the fake news business in Veles had a, 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 a quote. They said something to the journalist, a direct quote. So I cut out all the direct quotes and I fed that into the artificial intelligence system. And based on that, the artificial intelligence system generated new quotes that kind of look like it could be said by someone like this. Mathematically, it is similar to what the people in Veles told the journalist, but it's basically uh, computer generated fabrications. And that is, you know, deeper and deeper, I went into the, the sort of synthetic uh, in, in disinformation uh, of this project. Um, so in a way, the only thing that I haven't uh, really uh, manipulated somehow are the original uh, quotes from the Veles fake news websites that I showed you earlier. But of course, those are, you know, quotes from fake news websites. So they, of course, can't be trusted either. Um, even to the point where I told you about these facsimiles of the ancient book of Veles. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, what you want in a book like this, you want these ancient uh, texts to kind of relate to the modern material that you're making so that there's a dialogue between the old part and the new part. And, and then, it, then it becomes sort of musical and becomes artistically interesting. Um, my problem here was that the ancient book of Veles, which remember was also a forgery made by these two guys in Russia in the 1920s. Uh, it didn't really talk about 
the kind of things that interested me, you know, the, you know, the questions of, of truth and lies and fact and fiction and, and bears and stuff like that. Uh, so, of course, there was only thing, one thing for me to do, which was take the entire English language translation of the ancient book of Ellis. I fed it into the artificial intelligence uh, text generator and it wrote 10 new versions of the book of Ellis for me, uh, from which I could sort of cut interesting bits. Uh, so these facsimile pages that you see here, they're kind of a mix between the computer generated and the original uh, forgery as well. So like I said, the only thing that is not really a, <laughs> a, a forgery here is, is, the, um, is the original fake news um, uh, quotations. And that is basically the, how this project went. Um, you know, this is maybe my proudest moment as a photographer when I started making embroidered uh, bears. Um, that made me feel like I had come a long way from my documentary roots as a photographer. So this became the Book of Alice, in short. Uh, now, the story doesn't really end there. In a way, the star story starts there. Uh, this became a book. I published it in April. And like I said, I wanted this to be a sort of almost like a Turing test, a, a test of where is this technology today? I know that the material I made on my own without any training is not as good as the Hollywood, Hollywood studios would make it if they had the same task. My question is, is it good enough that people don't notice? So I, I decided to try that. So I published this book, The Book of Alice, in, in April uh, of twenty one. My idea was that I had put enough hints in here that, you know, within a short time, people would realize there's something wrong here. You know, uh, this is too good to be true, or this text reads really weird, or why are there bears walking all over town? And, you know, people would start debating this on social media, et cetera, et cetera, in the photography world primarily. And I would sort of introduce myself into the, those debates and you know the truth would come out and we would have a debate about synthetic imagery and sort of the information landscape etc the question how long would this take would it take you know a couple of weeks a month i didn't know but i thought it was around there somewhere the problem is this didn't happen you know so basically um all i got in return was hearts on Instagram, thumbs up on uh, Facebook. You know, everyone was loving this book. They were saying, what, what an interesting uh, report about an interesting theme. Um, you know, I didn't get any critical questions. Nobody asked me anything. Uh, and people started buying the book. And, you know, I was sharing the material on my social media channels uh, to try to sort of bait people. Uh, and people were just sort of loving it. And... At one point, people started commenting both in direct messages to me and also on social media, how they thought the text was so interesting. You know, it's important that, you know, journalists are out there making investigative reports like this. And, you know, people bought more and more into it. And then I realized, you know, we have a problem. You know, my plan of this sort of generating instant debate uh, basically failed. I realized they might never notice that this is a fake. This, this whole project might just live for a while and then fizzle out because uh, everyone accepted everything as truth. So I realized I need to create my own plan to make sure the truth comes out. And I thought, where, what are the mechanisms in which fake news spreads? Uh, well, one of them is fake social media profiles. You know, the big troll factories in Russia, et cetera, they're experts at this. Um, and I decided, you know, I, I could maybe ensure that the truth comes out if I create my own fake social media persona. So I, I stepped into another very strange landscape, which is sort of the, the marketplace for fake social media profiles. And there, of course, you have a great uh, variation of, 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 of vendors. Some uh, sell you uh, lots of profiles at a cheap price point because they're kind of bad quality. Others are kind of more boutique, uh, high-end um, uh, vendors of fake profiles. So I went to one of those. I said, give me um, a profile with a sort of Eastern European sounding name. 
Um, um, and this is where this person, Chloe Miskin, comes into the project. She was basically a fake a Facebook profile. She came with her own Facebook uh, profile pictures, uh, which the vendor claims to be generated by artificial intelligence as well. I can't um, say for sure if that's true, if that is the case or not. But anyways, Chloe Miskin, I got her in the early summer and I uh, created a sort of persona for her that she was actually from Veles, the town, and she would sort of stay in the background and be a safety valve for me to make sure that the truth about my project came out. So basically I spent the summer infiltrating her into the documentary photography and journalism and museum community uh, around the world. Basically all my contacts and all my contacts, contacts, etc. And through the summer, she, she got, you know, 700 uh, uh, Facebook friends that were the heart of the sort of photojournalism, editors, curators, photographer colleagues, etc. So she stayed in the background uh, waiting for my instructions. Um, the one thing I couldn't do with this material is to, for example, do what I normally would do with a project is to sell it to a magazine. I, you know, have give it to the Guardian Weekend or the New York Times Magazine or something like that and, and see if they wanted to publish it as a feature story. That I felt I couldn't do because I would lose control of the material. It would be basically, um, you know, creating fake news, placing fake news into mainstream publications. Uh, that, of course, ethically, I felt I could not do. But I wanted to somehow test whether the material I had created in the Book of Ellis would pass not just the social media world filters, but the sort of institution, the professional uh, institutional filters of, of the journalism and photography world. The one place I felt was a legitimate target for this was the Visa pour les Marges Festival in, in France, which uh, in Perpignan in, in France, it uh, is in the early September every year. It is the world's biggest photojournalism festival where the curators of the festival go through all the photojournalism that was created in the last year and pick out what they think is the best and show them in exhibitions and on giant um, projection screens in the evenings like this. Um, because this is an industry event, I thought this might be a legitimate target for this. So I sent it to them in the early summer uh, without saying what this material actually was. Uh, they came back to me asking, very interesting work. Uh, would you like to have a screening at, at, uh, at the festival this year? And that's what happened. So in early September, after the whole summer had gone and nobody had asked me any questions about this material. Um, it was accepted and shown in the world's biggest photojournalism festival. Um, and this was about as far as I wanted to take because now I had really sort of gone beyond any line that I ever thought I would cross. And I had decided if it comes to the point where nobody asks any questions all throughout the summer, and it is shown at this industry festival where all the magazine editors and my photographer colleagues, they're all sitting there looking at this material. If after 24 hours after that screening, nobody has said anything to me, or asked any questions about this material, then I have to blow my own cover. And this is me si sitting at home the next evening after there has been complete silence after the screening. And I'm about to send my friend, Chloe Miskin, uh, my fake profile into the world with grave accusations against me on, on uh, Facebook, um, saying that this, this project is really fake news. Somebody should investigate it. There's something wrong with this material. And I thought, this is basically the end of my career. You know, people are going to explode. Uh, you know, people are going to attack me from, from all sides. The thing is, nothing happened. It, it went quiet. So Chloe doesn't give up. She goes into sort of 
photo discussion forums on Facebook with the same accusations. And their debate starts and people start debating what I have, you know, you know, Chloe doesn't say exactly what is wrong in these pictures because I wanted to, people to figure that out themselves, but she's alerting them to there's something uh, wrong here. Uh, Jonas is manipulating us. There's something that should be investigated. And people start debating. But on this Facebook forums, people end up, after lots of discussion and Chloe arguing against me, they sort of end up siding with me. You know, they, they tell Chloe Miskin to go get lost. She's so negative. She's coming with all this critique. Stop it. Don't, don't, uh, don't uh, destroy the good vibe here. So I realized I was probably in the wrong place. I should have been on Twitter, you know, where the ignition temperature is much lower, where people argue uh, much uh, more violently. So my plan to reveal the truth on Facebook fails, and I have to spend a few weeks uh, creating a new profile. Chloe Miskin on Twitter. Uh, I buy fake followers for her. I even create friends for her on Twitter so they can attack me en masse. And um, it takes me a couple of weeks. After that, around the September uh, uh, 20th or so, uh, Chloe is ready. She comes with the same sort of accusations on Twitter. She uh, goes into existing discussions about photography ethics on Twitter and and attacks me there. And then finally, uh, it sort of explodes a little bit. Uh, people uh, get very upset about uh, the idea that I have done, you know, I have paid people to appear in my pictures. I'm, I'm sort of deceiving people, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, and uh, Chloe uh, pours gasoline on the fire and, and, and people get upset. After about a day of this, uh, one uh, very sharp-eyed uh, critic um, discovers that there is something wrong about Chloe Miskin as well, because she realizes that one of Chloe's friends, whom I needed a profile picture for, so I looked in some of my other rendered uh, computer-generated images, she was wearing exactly the same funny pink sweater as one of the people in my Veles book. And uh, he puts two and two together and realizes that this is basically a trick that I'm playing. And uh, I can finally, after many months of, of uh, being a criminal, I can breathe out and uh, tell the truth about this whole project. On Magnum Photos, my agent, we run a big uh, Q&A about exactly the motivations and procedures that I went through for this project. I share it, Magnum shares it on all our channels to make sure people now get a follow-up. And uh, it creates a lot of, of debate out there and, um, and discussion about uh, not just what I have done, but also about the issue of synthetic imagery and information. Um, yeah, there's a lot of noise on Twitter. The um, people at the Visa Polymarsh uh, Photojournalism Festival, of course, put out a statement and they are also somewhat upset with me, as I can understand. Um, I hope that, uh, but, you know, I think in a way we have a very similar agenda because this whole project I have done is basically done from my side as an attempt to protect journalism. For, from my side, this is not an attack on journalism. This is a, an attempt to wake us up to the, the uh, you know, huge threat uh, of, of synthetic information uh, that I believe we will get very familiar with in the years ahead. Um, there are other people who are, are not very happy with me, uh, not everyone expressing themselves so diplomatically. Uh, and that's when it's very nice to have a um, alter ego on social media that can help uh, spread these kind of criticisms even further. So Chloe Miskin, she's actually still out there uh, spreading every critique uh, against me on, on all channels. She's basically completely unstoppable. And um, anytime there's a review or, or someone says something uh, negative, uh, she's out there uh, spreading the word. Um, 
but there has been a lot of uh, interesting writing about this and and uh, the project has you know from my perspective been successful in, in in really starting a big discussion about synthetic information and the information landscape of the future um and uh, you know if it's this easy for me to even fool you know the industry professionals of photography and journalism how easy isn't it to use these technologies to um to deceive uh, you know people everywhere so this is le monde the washington post um norwegian newspaper uh, danish uh, national paper that also wrote about the this question that I'm posing on their on on their lead editorial, which uh, was an arena they have never written about photography. So, for me, I, this is really. I had many questions about my own project and what my own methods here, but in a way, I felt that, in a way, I'm it, it it's um it it's been worthwhile because it has started so many discussions out there and really. Um, uh, made us uh, maybe aware of, of this issue, El Pai. I'm, I'm, I'm ending this with just a little uh, look at, we see here Wired, the tech and, and media magazine in America wrote a big article about it. Um, I'd have to just stop here at the end of the presentation because this is not just showing it to, to, to brag and, and show how successful this was, but this generated the most interesting media coverage I think of this whole project because as Wired was publishing this in uh, on their site, I was looking through my Google News alerts to see if anyone else was writing that day about my project. There was a time when 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 a lot of media coverage was happening, and I saw there was another media that I hadn't heard about that was also writing about it, called TexasNewsToday.com, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. They're writing about it even in in regional papers in America. That's really great and very successful because now the debate has even reached certain middle America. And I started reading it and I saw, wait, this, this kind of reminds me of something. And I realized, oh, it looks exactly like the Wired article. The headline is almost the same, except it changed one word, bogus and fake. But the construction of the article is almost the same, except on the texasnewstoday.com article on the left, they have all these banner ads and, and, and you know, the, the writing is a little bit funny. They have kind of changed some of the words. Uh, they've misspelled my name throughout the article. They've rewritten some sentences, but it's basically lifted the Wired article. And I, I thought, what, what is this? And I thought, the one thing this reminds me of are their original fake news websites from Veles. This is exactly what they looked like. And I thought, oh my God, is it the Veles fake news websites that have, are stealing articles about my fake project, about their fake news websites? And my mind is starting to boil. Uh, and I start trying to figure out who these guys are in Texas. I read about us. And it says, you know, utilizing a vast network of strategically situated correspondents all over Texas. TexasNewsToday.com is at the vanguard of every breaking news story that matters most to the common man. And that is a you know, national and international newspaper. So if, where are they in Texas? Are they in Dallas or Houston or Austin? Where are they? Oh no, they are in Pune, Maharashtra state, India. Oh, that's strange, you know, for a, a Texas paper. Um, and who is this Louis Privé that is writing? Because the Wired article was written by a guy called Tom Simonite. So who is Louis Privé? So I started looking at texasnews.com. What else has he written? And this is just one screen grab from one moment in time. And you can see all his articles, nine hours ago, 14 hours ago, 14 hours ago, 17 hours ago, 21 hours ago, 22 hours ago, 22 hours ago. So basically the guy is writing seven, eight, huge long, long form articles every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. So that's basically a bot. And that's basically what we're looking at here. This is not just an Indian news, fake news site that has kind of copied the the business model of the Veles news sites. 
But this is taking it one step further because this is automated. This is basically crawling the net, stealing articles, automatically rewriting them and, and republishing them and creating clickbait and, and, and links and, 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 and income generating material. And you, you can see it's automated because if you looked at the publication history, for example, on Google News, you could see that the Wired article was published, let's say when I saw it first, eight hours ago, and texasnewstoday.com eight hours ago. They were published simultaneously. So this is basically uh, an automated news site. Um, we'll, you know, with a little bit of better graphic design, a little bit of better algorithm, will people ever be able to tell the difference between a sort of automated bot clickbait fake news site and the real thing? I think people are already having a hard time seeing that. If you go on the, um, on the uh, blogs out there, you could already find people citing Luis Privé at texasnewstoday.com as a credible source of information. Uh, and this is probably the best picture we have of the information landscape that we're about to walk into, where this mixture of information, misinformation, disinformation, information created by humans, misinform disinformation created by machines, and combinations thereof, we're going to be having a huge problem sorting through it all. And that's, I guess, the main message I have for you today, that this is something that we will have to deal with in a big way in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you for your presentation. Um, that was uh, fascinating, actually, to be to be very honest with you. I, I don't want to, to, to waste so much time, and I'm going to go through the questions from the students we, we received. Uh, let's start with the first one uh, from uh, Zuo Chen. He, I guess he or she, she probably said, um, what experiences of your develop your sensitivity of creativity and originality? And what do you think common people, not from an artistic background, could do to maintain or improve their creativity? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question that I, you know, I could probably uh, spend four hours some more uh, talking about uh, a whole seminar. But if I'm going to boil it all down, you know, for me, this is really everything I do, the basis of all of my books and reports. And, it boils down to curiosity. You know, it's all about curiosity for me. It's, it's about sort of like letting curiosity, questions I have about the world, you know, questions about myself and, and my neighbors and, 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 and use that as fuel to try to create something that lets me grapple with those. You know, that, that's really what it's all about for me. You know, for me, photography, I'm not so interested in photography itself. I'm, I'm interested in sort of photography as a tool for me to explore all those questions I have about our world and society. And, you know, that's where the creativity comes in. I just sort of let, um, let, uh, let, let it be a tool to, to, to let that curiosity, you know. So if people don't have any ideas, they, they don't know what to do, you know, I... I suggest, you know, go figure out questions you have about the world. Thank you. There is a, a, a question. It seems like a very simple question, but at the same time, it's uh, very important for all of us. This is the question from Boling Cheng. As a photographer, what is your process for creating and selecting your own profile picture? The one that you use for your Facebook profile, for instance. And as you can imagine that everybody is concerned about it. <laughs> uh, well, in many places in the world, they, they start using avatars instead of the real, uh, you know, in, in many parts of the world, that's uh, quite popular. Uh, no, but I mean, for me, um, um, you know, I don't know. I, I use Facebook quite sort of, and, and these social media, I, I don't use them so much as a personal 
uh, a page for me. It's a, it's a window uh, to my audience as a, a creator, as a photographer, as a journalist. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I don't want it then maybe to be uh, super personal. It's uh, simple. Um, if you go on my uh, profiles, you'll just see a simple uh, picture. Uh, but um, you know, I, I think it's a it's a question of you know, do you, do you see it as a sort of a something in your personal sphere or not? And for me, it's not. Another question from um, Eden Dodgman: When you were a photographer in Russia, there was only you as a photographer to witness. Today, with the advance of smartphones, more and more people can photograph what they witness with a good quality. So, how would it be still relevant to be a photojournalist in the future? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a very relevant question for the industry that I'm part of, you know. I, I, and um, you know, uh, of course, the role of a photojournalist or documentary photographer has changed a lot in in the last decades. Not just now with the smartphone, but you know, TV and, and you know, internet, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You know, back in the 1960s, you know, the photographer was really the, the first hand witness of, of, of a world events, you know, maybe the first one on the scene and people saw the image two weeks later and it was still fresh. Um, today, of course, like the person mentions, um, you know, citizens uh, themselves often provide the first uh, encounter visually with something. But, you know, while we have a world where, you know, billions of images get uploaded uh, to the internet and to the social media sphere uh, every single day. Um, we have an enormous mountain of images that keeps growing and growing every single second, every single minute. You know, what's the point of being a photographer? You know, adding a few more pictures to that mountain doesn't make any sense. The way I look at it is that my job is actually not primarily just as one that creates images. For me, it's about ideas. It's about storytelling. And, and, and really, you know, while we maybe see billions and millions and of, of basically good pictures being produced by everyone all the time, we don't see millions and millions of people uh, sort of produce good visual ideas or good visual storytelling. Uh, that's kind of long form and in depth. We don't see millions of people doing that. And that is basically, I think, think the role I see myself in. Also, you know, in terms of journalism, I don't necessarily see my role as a sort of first page actor, you know, someone who is producing imagery for the newspaper's front page. I see my role more in the commentator section, in the editorial section, in the debate and background section of the newspaper. And I think, uh, you know, uh, that, that's an arena where, 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 where professionals in this field have an important role to play. Thank you. Uh, the last questions that we have, we don't, we, uh, of course we have a lot of questions, but we don't have so much time. It's from Nina. Uh, Nina, um, what do you keep in your mind from the, you, you, what do you keep in your mind from your years living in Russia? Uh, well, I mean, uh, there were, those were very formative years for me, um, and I, I had, a, you know, I'm, I've always had a sort of big um, fascination for that part of the world. Um, uh, I mean, for me, it's always about sort of, okay, you have this sort of geopolitical uh, level of things, and you have, um, you know, the stuff we read uh, in the newspaper and, and, and sort of battles for supremacy of, of the geopolitical scene. Uh, but for me, you know, I've, I've always been looking for the, the interesting uh, individual stories, the individual personal stories. And, and, you know, I've always found, you know, Russia and, and, and that part of the world, you know, an endless uh, source of amazing um, individual stories uh amazing communities amazing people and and you know i've i've, I've made a lot of work uh, you know chronicling people's uh lives there o also in the sense of of sort of uh you know russia can be a brutal system in some ways also historically and and uh and um and, but, and that has created some very strong people and and you know strong stories 
uh, so, so my approach has always been to go on the sort of individual level. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have so much time, but again, thank you very much. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, on behalf of all the students, uh, I just want to thank you again. Take care of you. And, um, and we hope that maybe one time you will be able to join us at the campus for another conference. Take care. Thank you so much, Jonas. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.